All right, could we please start with everyone introducing themselves so the people out in YouTube land have some clue who we are, and then I'll introduce why we're doing this and let Corey throw in anything he wants, and then we'll turn the floor over directly to Francois. Good? Awesome. <laughs> All right, for my convenience, because I've got this thing in clockwise order, I'm just gonna start with Jirji and then move forward in, in clockwise way and I'll call on people. So please begin, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Well, uh, hi, uh, YouTube. Uh, my name is uh, Jirji and I'm a student in Berlin and I'm currently standing in for the Sabre instructor at Tweichau Berlin. Uh, HEMA club, as the name suggests, in Berlin. And yes, my, how should I say this, main source that I'm currently studying is the Berlin uh, Berlin uh, cut fencing school uh, from 1808 to about the 1880s. Um, that's about the gist of it. Awesome. All right. Mas 10. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Markus. I'm from uh, Germany, Erlangen Meisterhofverein or club and um, recently I started studying uh, Arlo um, which is in the Italo-Hungarian um, lineage um, yeah and uh, I'm like a, a little bit of an instructor here and there but soon I uh, wanted to start uh, so, so basically I started um, teaching it myself with, with uh, some guys from the club and soon I want to basically make a class with every, everyone, with everyone else. All right, Iso, how about you? Um, well, my name is Isabel. Um, I mainly study longsword at my club because that's the only thing my club does uh, in the German tradition, but I also like to study Vadi, Italian fencing master, and I translated um, a fencing book from the, the 1900s, which uh, from uh, Major Feldman and Russ edited it, so that's cool. <laughs> Sweet. All right, Francois. Hello, uh, I'm Francois Perrault. I am uh, currently uh, assistant instructor for longsword at, um, at La Compagnie Medievale. I teach our beginners the fundamentals of uh, German longsword. And other than that, when uh, the slot permits are scheduled, I also teach a uh, counterpoint, so for essentially French saber uh, at La Compagnie Medievale. I've also uh, learned some uh, Spanish rapier from the Stresa from my good friend Andre Hajar, who's uh, also uh, starting his own project. So that's, I may be attending that eventually. Sweet, Corey. Hi, hello, I'm Corey. Uh, obviously uh, been doing a few videos with Russ now as we uh, try and take over the HEMA Sabre world. Um, I teach, I use that term loosely because um, I'm not a maestro or anything like that. Um, but I teach uh, Italian saber, uh, Radialian in particular, uh, at Scala St. George, uh, Dallas. Um, we're kind of also branching out into uh, some of the Italo-Hungarian stuff with the help of Russ and uh, his recent translations. Um, so yeah, praying for the end of summer and uh, looking forward to this discussion. Cool. Okay, so I'm Russ. I do a bunch of saber stuff. This is Rosie. She won't be in my lap very long because she's a giant pain in my tail. She also thinks she's a puppy who still weighs seven pounds. She weighs 36, it's a little different. The reason I set this up and why I'm tongue in cheek calling it cooler than Hutton is actually not to throw shade at Hutton himself. See you, Marcus, give me just a second. Okay, because okay. in some ways, Hutton was actually a really cool guy, lifelong martial artist. We can disagree on what level of skill he got or whatnot, but the problem is that Hema Saber has a real problem. Over and over and over and over again, we see that we now have an embarrassment of riches of sources, and everybody goes to the same two that have been floating around since the 1990s. And there's nothing wrong with using sources that have been around a long time, even if I'm well known for throwing a lot of shade on one of them pretty famously. But we've got lots of things available, and I wanted to get together a group so people could show off and say, hey, I do this. It's cool what do you need to know to do it so that if you're beginning in Saber looking around, the question that we get over and over and over again is, I want to do Saber what's cool. Well, 
Today, Francois is going to tell us what's cool about ContraPoint and what he does. Cool? Marcus, did I cover what you had your hand raised for? Uh, I, I uh, forgot like a big part of my introduction, actually. Um, I don't only do Sabre, I also do long swords since like four or five years ago. And uh, I also teach that. I just wanted to add it, but because it's a little bit important, I guess. It is. As much as yeah. we like to dunk on long sword for general principles, it's yeah. important to realize, yes, it's a vibrant and important part of the HEMA traditions. Well, and most, important, most importantly, longsword is still fun. Me preferring saber does not mean I do not like longsword. Exactly. Longsword is pretty cool, especially when you can compare two sources. <laughs> and ten, I agree with that. Detected. All right, Corey, unless you have anything else, I'm going to turn the floor over to Francois, and he's going to tell us what's super cool about what he does. No, I want to hear about uh, French saber contrapoint. I've been looking forward to this. Right, so uh, I'll begin then. Uh, you notice I said uh, in my introduction, I said console point, and then I corrected the French saber, and because that's usually what sells it more. But in actuality, saying I do French saber is kind of a misnomer, in the sense that uh, the French, how they conceive fencing, uh, is fairly different. Uh, we're not separating by individual weapon types. Uh, you know, if I hold the saber in my hand. Sure, I have a saber in my hand, but how am I going to fence with it? That's the bit that the French use to distinct to distinguish with it. So in French, uh, the French school, you have point, which is simply uh, thrusting uh, actions that you're going to do. You have estadon, which is going to be only cutting actions, and then you have contrepoint, which you will add the the cut and thrust, and that's what the core contrepoint is. Now. Why I say that's a misnomer to call it French saber is because contrapoint, we know it's defined by only the blows we're, we're going to give. So essentially, this works well for swords that are very nimble in the point while still retaining some cutting capacity. So I can have a saber in my hand. I can have the spadroon. I can have a bunch of these different types of swords. I can have a more uh, curved or more straight saber, like say this model 1882 here. That's an ideal contrapoint sword, or equally, this one over here that I prepared in advance. You see, that's very much a Napoleonic curve here. You got a very uh, wide curve. And all of these are good contrapoint swords. Uh, whereas in French Saber, you also have Espadon, which you will have uh, documented with uh, Saint Martin as a full treatise. And then it's mentioned by other uh, small sword and foil sources as like you got to learn foil before uh, uh, doing. Going to Espadon, that's usually used with like heavier, more cutting swords. The kind of cavalry sabers you're going to see, like this on F here, that's going to be a good Espadon sword because while it, you can't thrust with it, it does feel a lot more choppy in the hands. So early on in the Napoleonic era, we know that Espadon was more popular, took, uh, got taken over by Contrepoint for a variety of reasons, which we can get into if you guys are interested. But also, this would be a good Espadon sword here. It's also a very wide, very choppy blade. And this pardon can also be used with uh, any blade that's fairly heavy, very cutty. So you can also include basket hilt uh, swords that you see earlier, like Walloon types. It's, this is what I mean by, I am not doing spe uh, specifically French saber. The weapon in my hand is a saber, but I am doing contrapoint. So, I'll let you guys have a round of questions if you have any this far. Yes. Uh, so my question would be, uh, so contrepoint is specifically referring to uh, cut and thrust fencing, yeah. um, but it does not refer to a specific school of contrepoint, where if you say like, for example, Italian saber, you have to specify if it's Rodalian or not Rodalian or any other source, contrepoint isn't a specific school, right? Well, one of the th interesting things about the French school is that contrapoint is an aspect of the French school. And we are definitely talking about a definitive French school here, because unlike uh, in a lot of other places in Europe, uh, the French, what they did is, um, I don't remember which king it was, but it was during the Renaissance, uh, late 1500s-ish. Uh, 
uh, there was a corporation of fencing masters formed with the approval of uh, the King of France at that time. And that charter got renewed and renewed all the time. And what that meant is the, uh, the company of fencing masters, uh, Paris uh, and its suburbs, essentially had the monopo a monopoly on who could teach fencing in France uh, by appointing, uh, uh, I'm looking for a word in English, I'll just say in French, uh, appointing the prévôt of fencing, uh, appointing basically any fencing masters uh, Anybody that was not accredited by them was not a licensed fencing master. And what that meant is that you could get a very standardized French school, distinctively French. And that yeah. carries onwards the more you go on in time. And so early on, we focus a lot on the use of the point. So a small sword, foil, whatnot. But then uh, you see things in like De La Touche in 1670, where he has this bit at the back of his book that I think some people will forget to, to look at, his bit on the Estremasson. And he describes in that, that's uh, in a contrast to Zeppe, I mean, he describes in that a certain uh, way to add, uh, and he recommends to add a cut to your game to make a, essentially a cut and thrust system. Uh, in 1670, back in a time where it wasn't being called contrapoint, but it is still a French cut and thrust system based on the principles that you see in the bits of his foil book. So what is that if not contrapoint? So actually, uh, there is, uh, that's why I say it's not necessarily, uh, there's like, oh, uh, it's not like there's a Parisian school of Contrapoint or in a, I don't know, like, uh, what's another French city? Marseille? Yeah, Marseille. It's not a uh, uh, for school of Contrapoint from Marseille because there is only one French school. Mm -hmm. You have that certain uh, level of standardization that you don't have in other places, like in Italy with the uh, Neapolitan school and the, uh, the Radialians and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I see. So it's very centralized. In that way, yes. And that keeps huh. on even after, Nepo uh, after the French Revolution, when that corporation gets the, gets the, uh, essentially, after a, friend, a corporation of fencing masters in Paris uh, disappears, their influence kind of stays with the fencing masters that have been trained by that and by people who were trained by that uh, until it gets reformed at uh, Joinville eventually. Uh, eventually. That's. Hmm. So throughout the whole period where we have a French, uh, like a French school, there is some divergence that happens in that little in between of the corporation of fencing masters and joint ville, but otherwise, it's pretty much a standardized French school, which is very nice actually because uh, then you can very clearly say here's things that do fit in it and here's things that do not fit in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, so that was going to be my question what's cool about the French school and what does fit into it versus what doesn't fit into it? Well, that's kind of a hard to say because pretty much most of the works that are going to be written in French are going to fit into it as a default, essentially because in France, uh, we have explanations of uh, various fencing masters uh, who were trained uh, from elsewhere because a corporation of fencing masters in Paris has a monopoly on fencing in, uh, in France throughout the whole, ex its whole existence. So that means that people who are, are French trained and uh, there. Now, this gets interesting when you get outside of France, because if there's one thing we know about the 18th and 19th century is that French culture is very popular and that extends to their fencing. Uh, if you look across the British Channel, I'm going towards the British uh, here. What we observe is that uh, we have people like uh, Domenico Angelo, who was a French trained fencing master. You have a bunch of people like him that go to Britain and essentially implant French fencing into uh, the British Isles. And one of the criticisms I, as from my French perspective, uh, perspective I have of a lot of British friends, people who focus a lot on their fencing as British, is that sometimes I feel some people do not realize that their fencing is a lot more French than they may realize because you're learning a lot of people who are learning the point, the contrapoint or espadon, but under different names. And one of the things that when I, I spoke with Kevin Cote, he told me, be careful not to anglicize French fencing uh, by calling a contrapoint and a espadon saber, like, uh, like uh, other people do, is because that's not how the French think about it. The English, however, what they'll do is they'll have simplified that and they'll have uh, systems for, for a small sword, which will be point, 
because essentially pointing weapon. They'll have a system that they call Spadroon, if you look at McVeigh, and then they'll have like Sabre and Broadsword. And that's like essentially a Spadon because the British uh, Sabre sources like to cut a lot more. But essentially, it's all just point, contrapoint, and Espadon. Uh, with some di differences because there's some divergence. You know, the British are not under the thumb of the Corporation of Fencing Masters, but otherwise it's, uh, it's a lot of that. And then what's gets, what gets interesting and why I think everybody should have at least some awareness of what the French school is, especially as it relates to Contrepoint and Estadon, is that once you get outside of France, French Fencing Masters and Oregon is exported only to uh, Britain. They also went to Germany, to Italy, to uh, pretty much all over Europe, all the way to Russia. Uh, I like to say it goes, the French influence in fencing goes from Spain to Russia, and that's a wide territory. I say Spain because uh, we have a Navy manual from, the, from Spain that's actually uh, just French uh, fencing. I don't, can't remember if it's a Contrepoint or Espadon specifically, but it is an import of that. And in Russia, we have Valville, we have Grisier who taught uh, the Russian Imperial armies. So it is a very wide field of influence. Understandably so, given that France was the military ass kicker of the late 18th and 19th century. It Pretty took much. all of Europe combined to put France down twice. So obviously their military advisors and trainers are gonna be an incredible demand. It's not an accident in the 19th century sources. While they start trending Italian at the end of the century, the French infl influence is huge and obvious for the earlier sources. It's a big deal. So what about French fencing itself it strikes you as, this is really cool, I wanna be involved with it when I'm first starting off in fencing. Well, for me, it was a, a bit of contrarianism actually at first. Uh, because I saw a lot of people do British Sabre in my club, and that's awesome. Uh, I, I'm super happy that they like it. But for me, that, that just didn't click. Uh, and then I found out that French, uh, French Sabre exists, which was not immediately obvious. Uh, I learned it, uh, about, um, that by trawling through the Kima Sources uh, document uh, data database at, uh, I think it's middleages.hu. And that's when I, I put the filters for French and Sabre and, oh, okay, there were like two pages of this, but just like, I think they're 50 long. And I was like, oh, okay, there, there, there is some stuff written on that. It's not all uh, sources that are gonna be very pertinent for fencing because it kind of regroups a bunch of uh, stuff that's loosely related. But when I saw that, that's when I was like, okay, yeah, that, this is an avenue I wanna go down because Sabre always looked interesting. Just, I didn't want to do British Sabre, so. What kept me going into it from there on, I'd say, it's more the fact that, uh, well, I mean, I got some investment to it, but at the same time, I was like, I, I came because I was like, no, I don't want to do British. I want to be one of the cool kids. And then I stayed because I was like, wait, no, there's, there's interesting stuff going on here. Like, like it's, screw this. Uh, especially when I figured out that um, this was super interrelated to all over Europe. It's like, oh, okay there's like a lot of substance to dive into here. And the uh, substance that uh, there's some people that look into it. I had a uh, site, uh, Kevin Cote, who I mentioned earlier, uh, Maxime Chouinard. Uh, there is um, Julien Gary also, but I mean, it's not a widely explored field. So that's kind of why I decided to go down there, especially being a native French speaker, that really helps me to go, uh, to, to go into those sources. I think you I think you raised a really interesting point that you know there's I'm going to borrow my 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 analogy right Roworth is a is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich if you ask my grilled wife cheese, grilled cheese fine we'll go with grilled cheese <laughs> a grilled cheese sandwich is really good but at the same time right sometimes you want something that's not a grilled cheese sandwich um and what's interesting is seeing how many of these things like Roworth is uh isn't he also kind of a descendant of the house of angelo right so this is also sort of tangentially related to uh both french and hungarian fencing right so seeing how um europe kind of like a bunch of magpies have found fencing systems and picked things out of it and then made it kind of their own sort of like what the hungarians did with radaeli 
it's really interesting hearing about such a wide range of influence that the French had. Um, so I, I'm glad someone else is sort of uh, taking the road less traveled, so to speak, to, to be like, no, I'm gonna find something different um, and, and bring it to us. I mean, going off that, right, one of the things I found really interesting in reading some of work is that, uh, well, not so much reading as I'm much taking classes from the people who are looking into that. And, uh, and I think it's Hope and Paige and all those people. It's all the time. I'm just seeing what, I'm, <laughs> what I've read in Saint Martin. All the time, just seeing Espadon. So that's, and even uh, I went to the Glengarry Highland Games and uh, competed in the broadsword there. Uh, and we took the, the workshops on the Friday, I think it was the Friday before, or Thursday, and, no, it was Thursday. And it was a broadsword workshop for the whole day. And the whole time I was like, oh, there's some of Saint Martin's uh, Espadon in there. There's a bit of contrepoint or some footwork that looks a lot like Saint Didier. Like I was like, this is, this is all very familiar to, to me. This looks very French to me. And then I'm seeing people like say, oh, this is, purely Scottish or like this is well I mean the the person who did that did not but the but online sometimes you know this is purely Scottish so this is purely British this is this is very much like I'm looking at it from my own perspective and knowing where this comes from like I'm not quite sure that claim sticks so I think that's also kind of a natural thing right if, if a bunch of people show up and have really cool ideas people go i'm gonna steal that and they take the little parts that they like and they bolt it on the systems that they already have or they or they iterate off of it i think it's sort of just human nature um one of my questions was you know because you you kind of established the contrapoint as kind of this just big um period of history is there a period uh, time period that you're particularly interested in that you're practicing currently? For me, uh, right now, it would be like the mid, uh, well, early to mid to late, uh, early mid to mid, late uh, contrapoint uh, of, of the 19th century, because that's where we have a lot of text written about it. A lot, like seriously, a lot. And it's where also I don't have to go look into British or German or whatever other sources to quite as much. Because for contrapoint uh, in France, before the revolution, you have De La Touche, you have McBain, uh, which is, he, he straight up admits in his book, like, yeah, the small sword and spadroon is just like taken from what I learned in France. Well, not, not in France, but the while he was at war in uh, Flanders, he learned from French trained fencing masters there. And uh, like pre-Napoleonic contrapoint is, exists. It is hard to work with though. Uh, so for me, just to establish that baseline, I think it's a lot better to look into uh, post-Napoleonic up all the way to, uh, I'd say about uh, 1908, when the last uh, army manual is published. By the point, they don't call it a point, they call it Sabre, though, because uh, Espadon was just essentially died out. It's been entirely replaced by Contrapoint in uh, the, the army. Okay. Are there like particular, like say I know nothing, right, of, of French saber or contrapoint in particular, but I want to like, I want to learn something about it. Is there a, a particular master or treatise that you would point someone towards as a beginner? Yes, uh, in English, uh, I would say uh, go buy, buy a copy of Louis Rondel, uh, 1892. Okay. And I think that will be enough for you to get started with. After that, if you want to get more, I know... Um, um, you can, I think Maxim Schwinnard did an excellent translation of, uh, of uh, the uh, Saber Lessons of uh, Mr. Biles, and that's amazing. I would absolutely want to add that. That's from 1862. And uh, if you can find a copy as well of the 1877 War Ministry Manual, that's also been translated in English. There's a free version floating around, but I'm not quite certain. I'll send the link to Russ so you can post it in the description later. Uh, in French, however, um, for to get started, uh, I would say the same things, but also, uh, especially assuming you can do both French and English, because I mean, if you're listening to this in English and you can speak French, I'm assuming yeah. you can also um, tack on uh, Brunet, which is 1884. That's essentially a more feature complete version of the 1877 uh, War Ministry Manual. You can also go take a look at Grisier. Um, 
and for both actually, uh, I would say read De La Touche of 1670 because he is very good at establishing the principles behind the French school of fencing, uh, the more esoteric kind of stuff. So all your uh, your distance, me you measure uh, tempo, whatnot. He describes that. Uh, he does, I think, a better job than anybody else uh, doing that. So if you speak French, I'd, I'd say read the French. Otherwise, you can, if you're in English, there's translations that you can buy available. So I kind of, I know you touched on Joinville like briefly earlier, but I kind of, it, it always intrigues me given how centralized everything was. Where does Joinville fit into this picture? I know that's probably like post Napoleon, right? So like, is this where everything's being taught? Is this where they're defining the French school? I'm not super confident about talking about Joinville yet because I have not looked into the historiography around that. Okay. Uh, so, but what I, I can tell you what I think it is, but uh, people like Maxime Trinard will likely uh, get angry at me and shake their fists. Like that's not quite right. And right so I, so, rightfully I just, so. But <laughs> I don't want people to be afraid of being wrong because if we bring someone out of the woodwork that's like, hey, that's incorrect, yeah. right? That's another person, especially if we get Maxime out of the woodwork to like comment on this, right? They're coming out of the woodwork to educate us. And the, by through that funnel, we educate more people, right? So don't be afraid to be incorrect. Obviously, don't, you know, if you're not sure about something, say, you know, hey, I'm not entirely sure. But, um, but yeah, just fire away. I mean, if we get Maxime to show up, then that would be dope as well. So hopefully so he comes up. The most I think I can say about it is, um, I think it's where they were training fencing masters to then, uh, fencing provosts actually, to then send them to regiments to train the actual people. Uh, that's what I, I, I think it was. And it's, it's kind of why it gets kind of re-centralized because uh, the army kind of sees its benefit of centralizing their uh, programs for training fencing masters uh, around this period, especially after the, the, after the defeat uh, against uh, the Germans. There's kind is, of like, okay, yeah, maybe we should, uh, you know, do, do a bit better. So uh, here's what I think, here's what I think I can say. I, I don't know if it's, I don't exactly uh, the date in which it's been uh, established or why or what, but here's, I can say, here's what I think. I think I would let somebody else that knows more about it comment more in detail and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because I likely am. So I'm, I tend to focus more on the actual, like, content of the fencing book rather than the history of where it comes from for now. Uh, that's one of the things I want to reserve for uh, my, uh, my history students studies I'm doing in university. I think I don't want to work around that. I always ask because in HEMA, right, everyone loves the fencing, right? But most of the time, yeah. the context is also really sexy, right? Because it kind of defines for example, at the same time, on the other side of Europe, right, Russ's uh, Hungarian folks are the opposite of centralized, I believe, right? So it's very interesting seeing two different, completely different um, sort of ponds where people are fencing in and just seeing how, how this is all going down. Um, no one's really paying attention to America at this point because we're not really doing anything fencing worthy, I believe, so. Well, at this point, you have Rondel, which uh, went to America. At this point, though, I'll let uh, Russ ask this question. So, <laughs> yeah, you have Rondel and you have Corbezier. His name's not an accident. So, the Hungarians, for instance, will refer to Italian fencing for the Sabre, and they'll refer to French fencing for the Sabre. And they give the French pride of place as the descriptive term for the Moulinet out of the wrist. So, you can't underestimate that. My question was originally a point, but as a question following up is, I don't wanna pee on somebody who's looking at British sources and doesn't know there's a big historiographic tradition coming out of it. It makes sense for them to read British manuals, not know the big background to it and go, here's the big British fencing. Obviously, Northwestern Europe is very cosmopolitan at least among Northwest Europeans. So you take a 19th century British person or a 19th century Walloon, for example, the chances that they can tell a Serb from a Hungarian is empty set. 
it's too big of a cultural divide unless they happen to have tra tra traveled a lot. But within their own neck of the woods where constant travel is going on, they're exchanging ideas all the time. So it makes sense that there's going to be a lot of that. So what I was going to come back to is original point. If you had to sell somebody on, here's a sexy thing that French fencing does that would make me want to do it. Besides the fact that you can honestly say alongside Italy, it's one of the two main branches of European fencing simply because it has so much influence. What would your elevator pitch be? My elevator pitch, it's a, uh, what if you use your saber like a small sword? <laughs> <laughs> because this is much more uh, important than this in the French fencing. Uh, if you look at Biles, uh, one of the things that you'll find in, the, in his manual is he kind of, kind of starts a play where you're engaged in third, right? And you're going to go under and thrust like that with some control over his blade. Oh, that gets put aside, get, gets put aside right? And then um, in a low preem. So, all right, natural conclusion to, to that would be to cut at your head. All right, parry, thrust. And this conclusion, parry, thrust, comes all the time, all the time, all the time. And, it's, and the amount of thrusting that uh, French Sabre co comes with surprises everybody from uh, any other uh, like Sabre fencing traditions that I've uh, encountered. Everybody was like, okay, there, <laughs> you would like to thrust. <laughs> I didn't expect that. And uh, even uh, people that, um, that uh, even people that know that going into it, they, they're like, oh, I didn't realize you can get a thrust like from, uh, from wherever I don't uh, I think there was a couple instances like I fought uh, actually Jay Mas uh, at um, the Glengarry Highland Games and caught fencing I could never beat him but I did surprise him I think I scored one point with against him with a thrust and I think that's uh, that, that, that thing that was my not just being able to to score one point on Jay Mas who beat me <laughs> beat me to a pulp honestly very fairly so uh, six to one. Uh, that was my proudest uh, achievement that day to be able to score one, especially with a thrust, with a broadsword and a hilt I wasn't familiar with. That has like, you know, you, you have your, whereas this I can hold it back here, like my point was going this way. So it was kind of difficult to get the point in line. My elevator pitch would be honestly like, uh, what if you use the, instead of using 40% of your weapon, you know, your blood, your cuts. What if you used all of it? Because, you know, people, I, I hear people say, uh, you know, your saber, you know, you're only using half your weapon if you're only cutting. I, as a French fencer, I would reckon that's more like 60 to 75, uh, that's more like 20 to 30% of your weapon that you're using. Because this is, this gets people. Mass, uh, man. Question? Yes. Um, so, as I understood it, uh, for French fencing, um, knowing foil is very important. Let's say I'm just a normal Hema dude who says, ah, I don't have time for that. Can I still learn French uh, saber or well, fencing? You very well can, but you should still read it. And the reason is this. Oops, my saber fell. Uh, <laughs> the reason being is this thing. This is the basis for everything that you're going to see in the French school, literally everything, because for, for the French school, you're not just learning uh, saber, you're not just learning uh, fo foil, you're not just learning small sword, you're learning French fencing. Um, how was I saying earlier about the uh, uh, point contre point uh, being defined by the cuts they give rather than weapon that's in your hand? I kind of liken that a bit to how a Meyer has like a unified system for uh, like, I think it's a longsword, de sac, uh, rapier, uh, pole arms and dagger. It's kind of like that in the French school where you have one system for your small sword, your foil, your sabers, your spud rooms, your whatevers. Uh, because when you open up a French source and you read into it, what you'll find in the saber section is 
you know, if your source is the, this thick, Sabre will be this much. And the reason being is everything that's your, uh, like, like the systematic fundamentals that you'll need to learn, such as your measure, your tempo, your everything, all of that, that's in the foil section because the French are assuming that you are training foil as much, if not more than you're training Sabre because this is the basis for French fencing. This is, this is not an accident. When people say, uh, I hear people say this all the time, it's like, oh, uh, you know, small sword is related to Sabre. It's, it's much more fundamental than just like, it's related to Sabre. It's literally the fundamentals of how you're going to start training. It's, you, you cannot ignore it. It's, it's like trying to, to, you know, bake bread and ignore the yeast. Like it's not going to rise. That's really interesting because, like, looking at the Rabbit Aliens, and, and again, this is my caveat. If someone figures out that this is wrong, please yell in the comments and uh, we will totally get you to explain it. Um, from what I understand, Rabbit Aliens' uh, foil was unremarkable completely unremarkable um and his his true thing was saber right so hearing that the entire basis is contained within the foil uh, sort of art is really interesting do they are they changing any of the parries at all to differentiate between foil and saber are they just adjusting or is it literally like these are all the same positions we're just doing slightly different things one of the best uh, best things i like about that is um if you look at Prem, which is kind of a, this sort of thing, right, where you're covering the, the lines here. In foil, this is what will be good enough because you just need to displace the thrust. In saber, you're going to use a Prem to, well, I don't have a saber, I have a switch on hand, but you've got a cut cutting. So you're going to have to cover the head here. You're going to raise the Prem from here to there. And that's the most common adjustment you see. You still keep the point forward because you want to be ready to thrust. But otherwise, that's the big modification you see. Uh, you do see a lot of uh, foil parries that are like, here's your foil parry uh, number, but here's how you modify it for a saber. So even within the saber sections, it usually refers you back to the foil. And so it's, it'll at most just be a slight modification of a movement you've already practiced. Yeah. Essentially, uh, I mean, that's why I'm saying it's foil is related to Sabre on a much more fundamental level in the French school than in other places. Um, you can't really pick up a, a French Sabre, which I tried to do at first without looking at the foil. You, I mean, you can, but it's it's not gonna work as well. Yes, Izo. Um, you said the, the French uh, school is centralized. So is it all pretty much the same system or are there like wild differences because this master said nah fuck that i'm doing this instead with modifications to references or that there are differences but those can happen mostly through time rather than like uh being a very uh de like a decentralized uh, school would be um in that sense where like uh, you see the stance especially early on you tend to see more and more narrowed stance wall my feet don't show here but uh you tend to see like a more narrowed stance here where in the latouche and whatnot and then you lunge quite wide because you know he's in the 17th in the 17th century so all those renaissance ideas and those are the ideas of aesthetic they look nice and get that nice lunge but later on you tend to see that stance get a bit wider uh which i think it's a uh, prevot mentions because uh I don't remember. It was um, we saw this in the Himbo Discord a while back. It was uh, how to fight an Italian foil foilist as a French fencer, and they were mentioning how if you have your stance a bit wider, you can lunge faster, and that's an adaptation you see over time that comes out of that uh, period when the French school was decentralized between uh, the establishment of Joinville and the death of the Corporation of Fencing Masters of Paris, uh, but. Aside from that period where there's like a lot of little differences that, that arise, there's like little splits that uh, come off. I think there's like the romantic, the romantic school of French fencing, and then there's like romantic, like there's different branches, a little, little different flavors, but they're all pretty much at the core of the same. So okay, that's cool. because I think there's only like one or two generations in between, uh, in between that uh, section. 
There's the people that uh, fenced during Napoleon. There's people that fenced after Napoleon and then Joint Veil happens. So. So one of the things that I like to ask simply because it's one of the biggest points of contention, I think in Sabre and HEMA these days is, is this a military Sabre system? <laughs> I and I'm going to keep oh, asking you. this every <laughs> single, I'm going to keep asking this every single time, right? Because every time some, I try to teach Italian fencing, someone's like, oh, that's just dueling sabers. It's a fake tiny sword thing, right? But like, it's very much a military saber system taught in multiple countries, right? And this is, I think, another great example of that. So I'm just going to, I'm literally every single person we have on this program, I'm going to ask this question because um, I want this sample size to be quite large. The best answer I think would be yes and Okay. So, so yes and no. <laughs> uh, it can be. That's uh, mm -hmm. essentially the what it boils down to, uh, because there are certainly military fencing manuals for that. But equally, the same sort of fencing gets applied in more uh, esoteric manuals that are described in more. Uh, you know, here's the ideals of fencing. What you'd normally think about, like a as a regular treatise on fencing, uh, just. Here's the platonic, like ideal things that you want to teach. Here's the teaching structure for fencing in a SAL. So it can be both SAL and uh, dual uh, military fencing, essentially. Um, there are some things that don't work quite as well, of course, in a more military context. If you're working in the ranks, you can't really go out to the sides quite as much. And, uh, you know, I tr one of the things that personally, in my approach, I like to look at it more as, uh, Sal slash dual fencing, because I think that it's much easier to count what's a good hit and what's not a good hit in that uh, context than in a military context. Because if I'm thinking, one of the things that you see a lot is um, you'll want to do a, say you have a spadroon or a contrapoint, uh, and we're both standing here. If we're, uh, if we're engaged in, yeah, in third here, uh, or, in, or we're not quite engaged and we're coming in and you want, you want to displace my point here, it'll go down, thrust me in the hand, right? If I go uh, out here to, to, you know, parry that because I don't want to have my forearm shanked, then, oh, I'm going to go out and cut on there. And contact point is very much a cut, a uh, thrust leads to a cut and a cut leads to a thrust. And in actuality, in a more military context, especially if you're fencing from horseback, that can not work quite as well uh, unless you've actually thought it. Like, uh, you see, um, I think it's Alexandre Mula, which I translated. He's a uh, technically contrapoint, but he's a very, very, very basic version of contrapoint. You would not uh, get a very good impression of what, how full it is as a system if you looked only at, at him. Well, Saint Martin is a much more complete system, uh, which he describes. And I don't, I don't think that's necessarily because, uh, you know, cut fencing is better for a military context. Um, because I certainly wanted to go more to, towards the thrust. And uh, I'm losing my train of thought here. <laughs> that's fine, because I can bring you right back to it. Because I'm going to bring up yet another of those things that everyone yells about. Um, so I noticed there's a very large rack of uh, actual swords that people use to fight with, right? There are obviously a bunch of different varying weights over there. Do the weights preclude you from practicing any of this stuff? Does it change it or does it fall apart completely? Or is it pretty much the same? Um, you know, how does how does the weapon weight and its martiality right influence what you're doing in contrapoint? I tend to prefer weapons hovering around the 700 to 800 uh, gram weapon uh, range. And to be point. clear, there's there are weapons on that rack in the 700 to 800 gram range, right? Oh yeah, this what you might think is like a long, like a Napoleonic cavalry saber because, well, I mean, it's not quite Napoleon; it's post Napoleon, like 1820s or something. It's got a thinner blade, which existed for infantry sabers of the period. It's got the same sort of length, uh, but and it might look like very much a cutting weapon. It's ideal for contrapoint point because this one weighs, uh, if I remember correctly, it's round. Uh, a bit less than the hit from the ground. I think it was 790. Okay. That's that's very light, actually, for a cavalry saber. This more, uh, this particular model is German, but it's uh, inspired from a French honest, 
especially the post Napoleon Napoleonic version. Uh, okay. You've got a bunch of these. Uh, I think my heaviest one is this one, which approaches the 900, 950 grams. Which is like this pipe back on F here. And that's more for us. What's mostly important is how that weight is going to be distributed. Is it nimble in the point? You know, if it has some kind of capacity, is it also nimble in the point? That's really going to determine oh, what style of sensing we're going to do. Because the French like the point a lot better than the cut, uh, because it it's faster to get to the uh, to the opponent. It's uh, especially with nineteenth century, eighteenth and nineteenth century medical science, it's a lot harder to fix a thrust than it is a cut. Uh, I mean. For a variety of reasons, the people like the, the thrust better in France. But in terms of like martiality, it's like I have no qualms about using this, this here with a big white guard for fencing with, because the purpose for my fencing weapon is very different from one of these. Uh, say this, I'm gonna have to wear this all day while marching. I may not even use it uh, in that day, you know. It's gonna be hanging there on my hip, uh, walking around with it, dangling around. I don't want it to be too long because, or else it drags on the floor. It gets annoying. And you know, if it has a big hilt, especially on this side, it'll catch on my hip. It's annoying. So for this, this is fine for for uh, for going out and fighting with. For the sal, I want this because this will provide me with much better protection. It feels very similar. It's, it's, a, it's flexible. Honestly, if I were to take these two, aside from the curve, they feel pretty similar in the hand. They feel actually quite a, close enough to the same. I think so, that's a really important point because we have, especially with Sager's, Sebastian Sager's big thing on the right tool for the job, that big blog post, um, that's absolutely fantastic. I recommend everyone read it, right? The, the idea that, you know, we should be using things that are carbon copy, exact replicas of exactly what these guys were fighting with on the battlefield at the time you just brought up. We have a fencing weapon and an actual fighting weapon and they actually both handle almost the same. Um, I think that's a really important point. What's important to replicate in a fencing saber is not how uh, it looks. If I try to replicate this for fencing with, it's going to be terrible. It's going to feel like nothing like the real thing. But if I try to replicate the feel, all of a sudden, I'm getting this Castile 20 millimeter blade and getting this hilt that's good for fencing with. Uh, it's, it feels almost one to one. Like, I think the only things that really change uh, is essentially the, the, the curve, which, you know, you get. I think this is a 30 millimeter curve ish, 25 actually when I last, when I measured, this is 50. So it's a bit more curved, but not substantially so. And it feels the same. And this is a much more uh, sensible weapon than what you see in a lot of HEMA makers making. Especially I got the, actually, I got the silk fencing here, which I think they've updated the model since, but um, this, what they've done is there's no distal taper. So this looks a lot like this, right? But it feels like this thing, like this uh, very heavy, like a uh, saber that I'd call for us, but almost a very, very choppy, very, very heavy. Yeah. So uh, that's my point. <laughs> All right. Anybody that's else? Anybody else have a question or? Any questions? That's all I have for yeah. the moment. Yes, George. Uh, I have one. Uh, let's say I'm, um, I know nothing about, uh, well, uh, Contrepoint or Espadon or Point itself. And I want to like get into the system. Where would you say somebody should start? Because you say it's a big, school it spans a few centuries and there's as you already said on middle ages dot you there's two pages of just different sources one can look at what would you say is the ideal starting point my answer the problem with that with that's my answer changes a lot on if you can speak french or not mm -hmm. uh i think um 
what I said uh, earlier, I think it's uh, there's Louis Rondel from 1892. He's very good here at establishing, establishing the foil and the uh, saber uh, system very well. It's very much uh, like you see uh, even some like very old school uh, modern fencing uh, coaches teach, but it is at the core just contrapoint. Uh, and the thing, what's nice about him is that it's very complete and it's in English. I'd add on to that, add uh, De La Touche from 1670, um, grab a translation of that uh, in English, The War Ministry uh, of 1877, and um, Maxim Fouinard's translation of Villas. And I think for that, you would have a very um, good general overview of what it is in English. All right, thanks. Uh, one of the things I'd like to add to that is don't pick Valville, Valville as your first source, honestly. It is, yeah. <laughs> do not pick Valville because despite the 1817 date looking fairly Napoleonic and the artwork being nice and you know it being bilingual, that's about all the nice things I can say about it, uh, about Valville as a source. Because the problem with him is that he's not very complete. He... Um, I think Grisier uh, sums it up uh, the best in his uh, criticism on Valville. He's, uh, he's like, to some of the effect of, like, I've never seen someone quite so apt as pre do, uh, performing any profession other than fencing the master. <laughs> Something like that. So he's, uh, the, the problem with Valville is essentially he's describing things you can do in Contrapoint, but he's not establishing a system. So he doesn't have any foil. He doesn't have anything Anything else. He only has that little bit of contrapoint. And there's, it's essentially structured like a bag of tricks. It's so it's hard. Like a, it's harder to, I'd say it's harder to work with than I-33. It's like a synoptic of, table without the rest of the system, basically. Essentially. Uh, so, and not just that, but I mean, Napoleonic Sabre, like, the date uh, could be very misleading. It doesn't have to be like around uh, you know, the 1797-ish to 1815 uh, to be Napoleonic. Like there's people after Napoleon that wrote and will have either experienced Napoleonic Wars themselves or uh, will have been taught by people who did. And I think that if you want to look into Napoleonic, specifically French fencing, that's where you should really look into because the French, uh, especially under the Napoleon period, they had other things to do than write about fencing. They were already teaching everybody they could to hold a sword to go and fight. So, keep going. Uh, okay, so there were. Uh, well, that's the thing is, I was <laughs> kind of done with that one. So. Well, all right. Thanks for the overview. So yeah, the. To resume, Rondel, Villes, uh, Maxim Trinot's translation of it, the 1877 War Ministry, and a copy of the La Touche would be excellent. But you can also add a McBain if you're interested in that. That's uh, He's very much a, a very street version of Small Sword, which is uh, uh, kind of weird, I guess, but you know, it's essentially French fencing. Sweet. Yeah, I have a copy at home. It's very much... How... <sighs> It's how should I say? Street like is, I think, the best descriptor for it. <laughs> he he led the call for life to say so, and his fencing lessons are also in the same vein. So, yep. Ishaba, I saw you change your mic around. Did you have a question? No, not really. But more people were talking and interjecting, so I was like, if I want something to say, I don't want to forget to uh, unmute. All right, does anyone else have any questions or are we about good? That's all the questions I had written down. All right, so if you're watching this in the comments and we get something wrong, light us up, we'll fix it or we'll bring you in to explain why we're wrong. Thank you very much everybody for participating, Francois especially this time around. And we will put our heads together and see who our next person is or why with this treasure trove of source riches we have, why we should be going to them and how we, the people who are in this discussion, can be the change we want to see and help make it available to those folks. Thank you very much. All right, see ya. Bye-bye, y'all. Bye, everybody.
See ya. Bye. bye. Thanks for this, by the way. That was quite, uh, that's pretty cool. Good. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I enjoyed like it. it. We should enjoy talking about sources. It's kind of what we do. That's kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I need to sit down and read them more. Uh, yeah, all the rest of us. And, and get somebody to teach me how to lunge right because my lunges are off kilter. My foil coach would be pissed at me lately. All right. Don't, have a good don't one. Get, don't get me to teach you that. I'm not, uh, I, I'm not quite there yet either. We've got more videos and content coming, so if you liked what you saw and it was useful for you, please stab the like button, slash subscribe, and punch the little bell icon so that you're notified immediately when new content comes available. Thanks, and go do the thing.